Welcome back, everybody. Wesley Trevenier here. Uh, today's lesson is about taking systems of equations, which we talked about last time. We had several different methods of solving them and changing them into a matrix method to solve them. And I know it seemed like matrices are going to be harder than all the other methods at first. I guarantee you that when the problems get bigger, longer, and harder, because they will, uh, the matrices are going to be the only feasible method that we have to guarantee our solutions. And so let's look at what this stuff actually looks like. Um, I've got a review problem up here uh, first. This is what we did last time. We took a system like this, and I'm going to solve this by elimination because it's very, very close to the idea of matrices that we're looking for. We looked at this system of equations. And we said, well, I can make the x's match if I multiply times negative 3 for the first one and positive 2 for the second one. And you see how it, that would make a negative 6x in the first equation, and it would make a positive 6x in the second equation. So if we multiplied everything in the first equation times negative 3, we'd get negative 6x plus 15y equals negative 27. And if I multiplied everything in the second equation times 2, I would get positive 6x minus 14y equals negative 8. And i got my curly bracket just to notate this is still a system. And we said after we multiplied, we added the two equations together, because we've already done our homework ahead of time, something will cancel out. When I do that, I was left with 1y, or just y, equals negative uh, 35, it looks like. Yeah. And that was our partial solution. We took that partial solution back to any of the equations that we wanted to. I'll take it back to the first equation. Just because I'm a little bit lazy, I see the numbers are at least a little smaller there. The 5 times 35 is 150 plus 25, 175. 2x plus 175. It's 9. I'll subtract that 175 from both sides of the equation. Give myself some more space here. Negative 166. And then divide by 2. x equals negative 83. So this is also my partial solution, but put together, both of these things combine to be x equals negative 83, y equals negative 35, or written as an ordered pair, I can do just x value comma y value. That was the solution. Notice that we want to do basically the same idea when it comes to matrices. Let me go back up to the top. The first thing we did with elimination was we multiplied. After we multiplied, excuse me, I'm going to turn on my, my keyboard there. When I turn on that keyboard, it prevents it from coming up. After I multiplied, I added, and then I ended up getting a partial solution. And so we won't be able to get the partial solution in quite the same way with matrices, but we will still follow this same process of multiplying and adding so that we'll change the system from something which looks a little goofy. Remember, this first system up here at the top we started with, 
didn't look that nice, right? It had two variables in it. We couldn't tell them apart. But once we multiplied and added, this thing had the same solution. And we couldn't see both halves of the solution here, but we could at least get a partial solution from it and, and work our way backwards from there. And so we'll do the same idea. We will multiply and we will add. So let's see how we turn this thing into what we call matrices in the first place. All right, let me get, get my space all worked out here. Translation into a matrix. Now this problem is a bit longer, a bit harder. Notice how this one has three equations and three variables within it. Right? Generally, you should have one equation for every variable if you're looking to get a single solution, right? or at least you're trying. We know, we saw last time that sometimes there are no solutions, and sometimes there are many solutions to a particular system. And certainly next week we're going to start solving problems which are pretty much guaranteed to always be infinitely many solutions. But we're still going to use the same ideas and the same tools of matrices to help us out. To change this into a matrix, I'm going to make a matrix, which is, a matrix is just a rectangular array of numbers. It's like a table. It's going to be set off by these square brackets. And every equation in my system gets one row in my matrix. So I have three rows because I have three equations in my matrix. And every variable, notice how in this system I've, I've done some prep work already. All of my variables kind of line up in like terms like this. And then my numbers on the other side of the equal sign. It's really nice that they do that. And that's what I want. So I'm going to just take the coefficients or the numbers out of this system. And I'm going to leave them in the same positions, right? The numbers in the top row of the system will become the numbers in the top row of the matrix. There's a one. You forget about that hidden one there. One, three, negative one. Right? That negative Z means there's a negative one there. 41. In the second row, the numbers are 2, 10, negative 5, and 1. And in the third row, 2, negative 1, 13, and 0. All right, so I've got three rows in this matrix. And I've got four columns. <clears throat> three columns came from variables, right? One, two, three variable columns. But this fourth column was a little bit different. The fourth column came from numbers. And I need to be able to show the reader, because once I start working with matrices, I'm not going to be able to see the system anymore. I need to show the reader that I, the last column came from numbers. And I do that with this extra bar. You can think of this bar filling in the same role as the equal sign does in the system. And with this bar, this is called an augmented matrix. The bar is what makes it augmented. So sometimes you'll see, it, you'll see people saying, well, this, this matrix has three rows and four columns, because you can count one, two, three, four columns. Sometimes people will say, well, this is three rows and three columns that are the, come from the variables. So I'm going to call it three rows, three columns. And most people will say, oh, well, we know that there's an extra one which comes from numbers. Um, I'm going to try to stick to calling this three rows, four columns. I don't want to assume that my reader knows or my watcher knows that one additional column will come from variables. And, and so in, in this matrix, Everything in the first column was sort of my X column, my Y column, my Z column, and then my numbers column. Sometimes you'll see me abbreviate this RHS, our right hand side of the equation. Right? Sometimes you'll see me just write a number sign, you know, like, like a hashtag. This one doesn't come from variables, but there are 
four columns in this matrix. So overall, I will call this a three by four matrix. And that symbol looks like a multiplication. It's not a multiplication though, right? So I'll do rows and rows first, columns second, three by four matrix. And in this matrix now perfectly represents the system of equations it came from. So I could go back and forth, right? Given a matrix, I could go back to a system. Right? The only thing which is, is, is keeping me from perfectly going back to a system is that nothing in the matrix says you have to label your columns. So I don't know if the variables used to be called A, B, and C, or if they were called X, Y, and Z. Or maybe they were R, W, and L. I don't, I don't know what the variables used to be called. Right? A little bit later on, we'll actually start labeling our columns. Right? But even then, you don't have to label them. Right? Rewriting those labels is going to take a lot of time. And they won't change anyway. So most of the time, I won't even bother writing those labels. Maybe for the first time I write a matrix, I'll write the labels. Every time after that, I'll just assume that Right. We'll, we'll keep the same label, so I don't have to keep writing it and rewriting it. So that's how we, we turn a matrix, or excuse me, turn a system of equations into a matrix. And, and if all things work out, we're going to have exactly as many equations as we do columns of variables, right? plus the one extra one, which comes from the numbers. Right? Next week, we're going to start looking at some which have more of one than the other, that's going to be kind of a special case. Uh, but for now, and for this week, we should have, it should match up. Right? So three rows, four columns. Or if it were a smaller matrix, maybe there's two rows and three columns. Right? That would mean there's two variables plus the third one, which comes from the numbers. Right? So what does that actually do for me? Right? So I've got this fancy rectangle grid Right? Maybe it looks a little bit cleaner because in the matrix, notice we don't have to keep writing variable names all over the place. It's much easier to just work with the numbers than to bother keeping track of all of my like terms. Everything in the same column were automatically like terms. And so as long as I don't start mixing my columns up, I'm fine. The rows, that's a different story, right? See, I could change the order of these rows just fine, and the columns wouldn't change, so neither would the variables, which I would stick on here. So let's see why the matrix is such a very nice tool for us to be able to use. I call this the working with matrices section of, of the presentation because just like when I have numbers, we have we know how to multiply add, subtract, multiply, divide with numbers. Well, when we're working with matrices, we've got three operations, right? You, can, you could consider a fourth one, but it's made out of two of the others. So it's not truly a fourth one. It's just a combination of two other ones that we'll do very often. Let's see what I mean. So there are three things that you can do to matrices. The first one is multiply. You can multiply any row by a non-zero number. I have to specify that it's non-zero because if I multiplied any row times zero, I'd just get a bunch of zeros. And wouldn't that mean 0x plus 0y equals zero? Well, zero equals zero might be true, but it doesn't help me solve anything. I mean, it's one of those vacuously true things, which doesn't mean anything. Everyone's have probably known somebody like that. You talk to them and they'll say things which are true, but don't really mean anything. Right? Sometimes sales, after talking to a salesperson, you can feel this way. He's just like, wait a minute. What did you say? Like, what you just said didn't mean anything. And so a non-zero number. So maybe I wanted to take the first row and multiply everything in that first row times two, kind of like we did earlier with our systems. 
we'll show that with a shorthand. Right? Here's how we'll show it. I'll say two times row one, R1, that's my shorthand for row one, two times row one replaces, that's what the arrow means, row one. So two times row one replaces row one. Right? Sometimes you'll see people use an equal sign instead of an arrow. I don't like to do that because, I don't know, I, that's just not how I'm used to showing it. And it's not really an equals kind of thing, right? Because we're going to start uh, doing more complicated expressions here. I don't like using an equal sign there. Two times row one replaces row one. So what used to be this matrix, 2, 1, 3, negative 4, 9, and 12, becomes everything in row 1 is times 2. 4, 2, 18, 3, negative 4, 12. Nothing in row 2 changed. And only the things which are in row one changed. And let me move this over just a little bit more. I can actually write my operation here. You don't have to write your operation between every matrix step you do, but I like to label mine using my shorthand notation so that I at least I know what your steps are. I have to be able to follow your steps to give you credit on your exams. And this is how we show our work. And I know, I know what you're thinking, okay, well, that's kind of nice. I can make the numbers line up. But remember, when we solved by, by elimination, the first thing we did was make the numbers line up using multiplication. And so you can start seeing the foundation of how we're going to be working with these matrices. I want to multiply times these numbers to make the, the numbers line up. And then maybe when they start canceling out in a minute, well, we'll start to see where that goes. That's the first operation. Multiply times any non-zero number. The second operation is I can add any two rows together. This is going to replace one of them. So let me take the same matrix and do an add operation. Here's how that might look in the matrix shorthand notation. I would say row one plus Row 2 replaces row 1. And again, I don't have any reason why it has to be row 1 in this case. That's just the one that I picked. Okay. Later on, a little bit later before we go, we'll, we'll go over the method for why we pick the numbers we multiply and why we pick the numbers that we add and why they should go in a specific order. But for now, we're just talking about the operations. So here I'm doing row 1 plus row 2, and I'm sticking the total back in row number 1. So let me go column by column, right? So row 1 plus row 2, that's 2 plus 3, is 5. Stick that back in there. And sometimes students will actually take these numbers to the side, right? like scratch work, and add them together there, 5, 3, negative 3, and 21. And that's not a bad idea, right? It takes a little bit more paper, but if you need to keep track of it, right, this is actually a pretty decent way to do it. So this was row 1, this was row 2, and this was the combination row 1 plus row 2. Right? And this thing is what got replaced in row number one. Five, negative three, excuse me, and 21. 
Row two didn't change at all. So I'm just going to copy those numbers back down into row number two. Now you can see the foundation really taking place because didn't we do something very similar to this when we did elimination? First we multiplied to make the numbers match, then we added to make them cancel out. And by doing so, we were able to take what used to be a system of equations with two variables and made it look simpler, made it look smaller. So we are definitely allowed to do either one of those things. And there's our shorthand notation for what that looks like in between. And when you're doing this on your test, I'm going to be looking for your shorthand notation because that's how I give you partial credit. I'm not going to be digging through 17 pages of arithmetic. Right? Yes, I will make sure that your arithmetic is correct, but what I'm on a high level, what I'm really looking for is if you have these operations correct, I know that you know what you're doing. Maybe the calculator didn't work out correctly, and that's fine. I can still give you almost all the credit so long as you tell me you know what you're doing and why you're doing the steps you're doing. That's two operations. A third one is we can exchange any two rows. I know it doesn't seem like this will be super helpful right now because if I did something like that, it might look like this two, one, three, negative four, nine, twelve. If I did that right now, it looks like this. Row 1 changes places with a double arrow. Row 2. So row 1 and row 2 just go back and forth. And all I do is write the second row in the first row. And the first row in the second row. And I know that that might feel like that's not super useful right now. Right? But again, when we start building our matrix methods up, right, we're going to need very specific numbers in very specific places. So this exchange process might come in, in handy every now and again. Right? But most of the time, you're going to be doing the adds and the multiplies, operations one and two. <coughs> Do you remember how I said that you could technically count four if you allowed yourself to look at four as a combination of two of the other ones? And so this is not really four, but I like to, some people like to think of it as four. This is when I multiply and add at the same time. Or at least first we multiply, then we add. I mean, if you were looking in a textbook, they might call this a linear combination. But I'm not sure that's a super useful Google word because that's a good word to use for a different class, and you might you might pull up things from a different class if you tried to search for linear combination. That is technically what it's called, though. Let me show you one of these linear combinations where we're doing multiply and add at the same time. Or at least, and we've got that combo going on. So I'm going to take a page kind of out of my elimination notebook, and I'm going to say, well, let me do three times the first row. Let me do negative three times the first row. Isn't that what we did earlier for elimination? We multiply the first row times negative three plus two times the second row. And all of that, let me dump it back into row number one. So that's what one of these linear combination rows looks like. And if you were writing your scratch work, you might say negative 3 times row 1 
plus 2 times rho 2 equals my new rho 1. In R1 is just my new rho 1. So negative 3 times rho 1 is negative 6, negative 3, negative 27. We all, we've seen all those numbers before. 2 times rho 2 is 6, negative 8, and 24. And when we add them together, we get something which looks like this. Notice how none of this changes the numbers in the actual matrix until I get to this part, to the end. These numbers now go in row 1. 0, negative 11, negative 3. I'll make those numbers black. There's nothing super special about them. I did my scratch work in blue. Row 2 did not change. I know what you're thinking, Professor. You just changed the hell out of row 2 because you did all your scratch work with it. But remember, when I'm doing a linear combination, it's like I'm, says, I'm stepping aside for a moment. This is kind of an alternate reality. This 0, negative 11, negative 3, this is the specific combination of negative 3, row 1, plus 2, row 2. So you can think about this linear combination idea as a way to temporarily change a matrix, right? Because I want a specific combination without actually messing up all the numbers in the matrix. And that's really helpful because, again, I'm going to want specific numbers in specific places. Some of them I'll be able to get there with multiply alone. Some of them I'll have to add. Right? Some of them I'll have to do both multiply and add. And when I can do both of those things without messing up every number in the matrix in between, right, it'll really help me out. So I've got three operations. Right? We call these things row operations. Right? If, if you wanted to be really technical about it, you could call it elementary row operation. But again, that's, that's more of a, a thing for a separate class, so I'm not sure that's a super useful Google term to use. I, I've included some links with the my open math folder that for good I call a business math level web pages that you can use. So these three things. So let's use some of these matrix operations. This process is called Gauss Jordan elimination. And we're going to actually have a full list of steps by the time we're done. But right now, let's, let's see if we can suss out what Gauss-Jordan should look like. We know that we could change this back into a system of equations, right? This equals 5y equals 10. 1x plus 3y equals 10, right? But again, we don't, want, we don't care about that. Right, right now, I just want to work with this matrix and see, can I solve this system of equations only using the matrix? Right? That is, can I find some operation set to change this into the matrix form of the answer? The matrix form of the answer would look like this. X equals some number. I don't know what it is. Y equals some number. I don't know what it is either. Well, just like I could change the matrix back into the system, let me change this answer, this answer here. Let me change it back to a matrix. So let me let my columns be X, Y, and number again. So the first equation has one X, but it doesn't have any Y's in it. There's zero Y's. And I don't know what number that is, right? Again, it will be an actual number by the time I'm done. But one, zero, and whatever the partial solution number is. The second equation has no x's, so zero. One y, and again, a partial solution number. I don't know right now. But this thing here, this matrix, super special, right? Because you can think about this 
is the goal matrix. I want my matrix to look like this by the time I'm done. Remember how I said we'd want very specific numbers in very specific places? Here's a good example, right? I'd like to see one, zero, zero, one. Right? The, you can see the pattern there. Right? Down the diagonal line is all ones, right? Down that main diagonal line. Everywhere else is zero. I call this the identity pattern. And if we have the identity pattern, we know that this is our solution matrix, and I can read the numbers directly out of it, right? If I actually had numbers in there instead of my number signs, I could tell you x equals blank and y equals blank. Okay. So that's not so bad, right? That tells me that Gauss-Jordan elimination, and by the way, I'm from Texas, I'll say Gauss-Jordan elimination, right? it should be Gauss-Jordan elimination, right? Did, he was German after all, but I'm from, I'm from Texas. I'm sorry. I'm going to say Gauss-Jordan elimination. Um, that's our goal. Take whatever we have, turn it into this identity pattern, one, zero, zero, one, with the numbers on the other side of the bar. So I have to be able to turn something into a one or turn something into a zero. And so you could think about this as sort of pre-step number one, right? What is the goal? Now we know our goal. Pre-step number two, how do, I, how do I turn something into a one? And then afterwards I'll do how do I turn something into a zero? So how do you make any number into a one? Okay. I'm just going to focus on the operation here. So let's pretend that I wanted to fix this number. Right? In my goal matrix, I'm going to scroll back up, you can see it. In my goal matrix up there, it should be a 1. How do I make the 2 into a 1? Remember, I only have the matrix operations to work with. Sorry, I'm going to try not to scroll too fast. I only have these three matrix operations to work with. Multiply, add, and exchange. And I can multiply by an entire row, but when I'm adding, because a lot of times I'll, uh, students will tell me, hey, why don't you just subtract a number? But notice how operation two, I can't subtract a number. I have to add two rows together, right? I have to use the entire row. And sometimes whenever you use entire rows, right, numbers get messed up that you don't want to get messed up. Multiply is a pretty powerful thing, though. Can you think of a number you can multiply to make a 2 into a 1? 2, oops. 2 times, I don't know, 2 times what? is equal to 1. Right? If you wanted to do this sort of algebraically, 2 times a number is equal to 1. Right? 2 times, I'll call it x just for sake of argument here. Isn't that an equation you could solve? Divide both sides times, so wouldn't that be 1 half? Right? So if I multiplied times 1 half, I could make a 1. Well, what if I were to make something else into a 1? How do I make, you know, a, a, a 9 into a 1? Divide by 9. It's 1 over 9. You see a pattern here? I can make any number into a 1 just by multiplying times its reciprocal fraction. How do you make a 23 times what number is equal to a 1? Divide by 23. I should multiply times 1 over 23. That's a pretty neat trick. Oh, excuse me. All right, when I get down here to the bottom of my screen, 
my hand starts messing it up down here at the bottom because by the time the palm rejection gets down the bottom of my screen, my palm is not on my screen. How about this one? What if I started with the number two thirds? How do I multiply two thirds times some number and make it equal to one? Before I said just divide by that number, but I don't know about you, but I don't think dividing by two thirds is something I like to do. Right? I always think in terms of multiplication though, right? can't I multiply both sides of this equation times a fraction, which would cancel out with two thirds? Right? That would have to have a three on the top, right? Because that would cancel the three. The three on the top would cancel with the three on the bottom. So on this side, I have to multiply times the same thing. And then it would have to have a two on the bottom to cancel out with a two on the top. So it would be this fraction, three over two. And if you remember from your previous algebra classes, we called this number the reciprocal fraction. Basically, the fraction turned upside down. And we, we used this a lot of times when we were talking about division by fractions anyway. So this was the number, the reciprocal, that I was looking for. So I can change even a fraction number into a 1. I can change a decimal number into a 1. I can change a whole number into a 1. I could change a negative number into 1. right? Because if I started with a negative number, wouldn't I just divide by negative 9 instead of positive 9? So negatives aren't really an issue. The only number which really is an issue is 0. I cannot change a 0 into a 1 using multiplication because 0 times anything is 0. I will never be able to fill in that blank to find a number to make a 0 into a 1 using multiplication. Okay, so this is not possible. We will never change a 0 into a 1. And so in our Gauss-Jordan process, we're going to have to have a step which says, oh, we need a not 0. Right? As long as it's not 0, I can change it into a 1 using this reciprocal fraction divide trick. Right? And so the lesson, the takeaway here, is any number can become a 1 except 0. Using the reciprocal fraction, except 0. When I when I when I'm looking for a one, right? You better believe that there there has to be a not zero there, right? Or if there's not, right? If I need to move things around, that's where that exchange is going to come into play, right? I have some limited powers of exchanging without messing everything up. Okay. So I know what my goal is. I know how to make a one when I need a one. Right? I feel like I'm almost ready to make this into a real mathematical process. I, I, the only thing left is how do I make a zero? Oh no, sorry. Yeah. That's right. We did the one already. How do I make a number into zero? And when I'm doing this in a normal regular class, I ask this question. I say, well, you see all the pieces out in front of you. You've got all your operations. How do you make a number into a zero? And nine times out of ten, a student will say, I know, multiply times zero. Makes sense, right? Zero times anything is equal to zero. And if I'm focused on that zero, sure, I'm going to make that into a zero. But do you remember earlier when we did the operations? Operation number one says you may multiply any row times a non-zero number. And so 
when I'm doing this in a regular class, I've got the, oh, I've got the whole shtick, right? You have activated my trap card. You're not allowed to multiply times zero. And so we can't use multiplication to make the zeros. I wish we could, but it really wouldn't help. That must mean that the only thing we have left is to add two rows together. Well, let's see. Sorry about that. My recording popped off for some reason. So I went on for another 10 or 15 minutes talking before I realized my recording cut off and something went wrong. So I'm going to go back, right? I'm going to use my highlighter to call attention to the notes kind of in the order that I would have written them. When we got interrupted, I guess, we were in the middle of the, the pieces of, of Gauss-Jordan elimination, right? We had found out how to make a one out of any number that we wanted to. And we were worried about the number zero. We said we can't multiply times zero because that was against the row operation rules. But I can use addition, right? I can make this three into a zero, for example, by adding negative three. 3 plus negative 3 is equal to 0. I can make this negative 8 into a 0 by adding positive 8. Negative 8 plus positive 8 equals 0. I could even do this with fractions, right? This is a pattern which is I can take to the bank, so to speak. Right? Sorry, go back up some. Oh, there we go. Sorry. That's a pattern I can take to the bank. Two-thirds plus negative two-thirds is equal to zero. As a matter of fact, I could make any number into a zero, but I had to have the right number to go with it. And this is what I don't like as a mathematician, because anytime I have a requirement or some other sort of thing which keeps me from doing what I want to do, I have to worry, well, am I always going to have that? Right? If I had a 3 in my matrix, do I always have a negative 3 to go with it? I don't think so. I mean, so while theoretically maybe this was nice, right? realistically, I didn't like it because it still limits me. Right? I can do it, but only in certain conditions. This is where the linear combinations idea came from. Right? That's what I did next. You remember the, the linear combination said I can multiply and then add. So I can take two numbers, two rows of my matrix like we did earlier, take two rows, multiply them times two different numbers, and then add them together. And I went through a few examples here. Starting with a 3 and a 1, I can multiply the 3 times 1 and the 1 times negative 3. And it needed to be negative 3 to cancel out. I'd get 3 plus negative 3 equals 0. Hey, that was nice. Right? 8 times 1 plus 1 times negative 8 equals 0. So all these linear combinations seem to be a way to get a number that I don't have. That is, if I need a negative 3, well, I can kind of make a negative 3 out of a different 1. Okay? And this even worked for fractions. I like this idea. Okay? We've already seen linear combinations was a valid operation. Okay? It only worked as long as there was a 1 to use, though. So I, I know it feels like maybe I'm kind of backing myself into the same corner because it only works because there's a 1. But... You remember earlier, whenever we did our, our how do I make a 1 discussion? I can make a 1 out of any number as long as it's not 0. So really, making a 1 is not that hard of a hurdle to clear. Right? As long as everything is not 0, I can do this. And we'll have to make a special exception for when you got all zeros. But I feel like I'm ready. I, I'm now almost completely unrestrained. I can make a 1 when I need to. I can make a 0 when I need to. As long as I have another number that's right, not 0, because I can make that number into a 1, 
and then do my linear combinations to it, I can make a one, I can make a zero. Right? And that's exactly what I needed. Right? My goal matrix was all ones and zeros. That's all I need to worry about. So let's make this into an actual method. Here are the pieces that I have on, on, the, on my board, so to speak. Right? One, I want the identity pattern. One, zero, zero, one. Got to have those ones and zeros. Piece number two, I'm allowed to use row operations, specifically multiplication. So I can be more specific there. Multiplication. To make a one. I'm allowed to multiply any row times any number except zero. But that's okay. I can make a one. Piece number three. I can use the linear combinations to make a zero. Okay? It, this one might require a one first, but we said that one is not hard to come by because I can make anything into a one except a zero. Okay? So I can make ones, I can make zeros. So let's make the identity pattern out of this. And I'm going to put these three pieces together into what we call the Gauss Jordan elimination method. Okay, so I'm going to start with any matrix. And if you follow the steps, you'll be able to turn any matrix into the identity pattern, or at least as close as you're ever going to get to the identity pattern. Let's take a look at what that looks like. Now we've caught back up to my, my real time here. I apologize again that for some reason, I don't know when the recording cut off. Maybe, I don't know. Let's see. So step one, if you have a row of all zeros, Move them to the bottom using exchange. Exchange them to the bottom. We need them out of the way. Because we said the only thing we could not work with is all zeros. So we'll get them out of the way. And actually, I'll call this, I'll call this step zero. Right? That's something we do before I even start working on the numbers. It's weird to have a step zero, but I'm going to call it step zero. If there's a row of all zeros, exchange it to the bottom. Using row exchange, right? Like row one changes places with row five or something like that. Yeah. Step one is identify the leftmost non zero number in a row. in the top row. Okay. The leftmost non-zero number. Remember, zero is the only number we can't make into a one, and we want to make a one out of this. So we're going to, to do the leftmost non-zero number. Right? Um, I would say the first number, right? but that kind of assumes that you know that we're reading left to right. If you, if you can assume that we're reading left to right, I could write this, identify the first number, the first non-zero row, or the first non-zero number in the first row, but again, that assumes that we're reading top to bottom. So I used position words rather than first, second, third, because I didn't want to make any assumptions. Okay. This is called the pivot. And that pivot word and that pivot super important. That's why I made it a different color. It's called the pivot. So we find the pivot. Once we found the pivot, make the pivot into a one. Remember how we said we could make any number into one? Except zero, right? 
But guess what number the pivot cannot be? Can't be zero. The pivot's already not zero, so I'm not, I'm not allowing that possibility here in step two. Any other number, I can make that pivot into a one. Right? If you wanted to write a little bit more complete version of these steps, you could say make this into a one using multiplication. Of rows. Remember, anything we, we do to rows, everything in matrices is row operations. So I'm going to multiply a row times a number to make a one, and I can always do that. Awesome. So here after step two, I have a pivot, and that pivot is equal to one. I'll put that here in my node. So at this point, the pivot is equal to one after step two. Step three, use linear combinations with the one to make all other numbers In the column, zeros, right? So wherever my pivot is, I'm going to go up and down that same column, and every number above it and every number below it will be zero. So the pivot will be a one, everything up and down from there will be zero. After step three. And remember, this is something I can do because as long as I have a one, I said I could use my linear combinations to make zeros. Something I'm allowed to do all the time, every time. So after step three, an entire column is ones and zeros. And the one is in the place where I want it to be, right on that diagonal line, hopefully. Step four. Move to the next row and repeat. Okay, that means I'm going to go all the way back to step number zero. Hopefully I can draw a line. I'm going to repeat the process until I run out of rows. Okay. If we get, to, if we, in the best case scenario, this will leave me with the identity pattern, right? We'll have some special cases that you'll need to see in the textbook and on the web pages of what happens when this actually messes up. But in the best case scenario, when I'm done with the Gauss-Jordan process, I will have a matrix of all ones and zeros, and then the numbers across the bar, which tell me my solutions, all the partial solutions together. All right, I'm going to pause. Pause here for a moment so you can take a screenshot of this. If you don't like my handwriting, I'm not the only person on the planet which has written out the Gauss-Jordan elimination process. Plenty of textbooks will find this. You can search Google for Gauss-Jordan elimination. Find lots of good websites, lots of good resources, lots of good places to look. But we're going to follow the Gauss-Jordan process, and we'll do one example together before we leave today. I just want to show you how I do my work. Three X minus uh, no plus five Y equals one, and X plus two Y equals one. I want to try to keep my numbers small right now. I know what you're thinking. You might be thinking, Professor, this looks like one I can do substitution with. Maybe so. 
right? I know that if I were doing this and I knew this was the only method I would ever had to use, right? This is the only thing I need to do this with. Yeah, I might choose to do this with substitution. But hear me out, right? I just didn't want my numbers to be really big for this problem. So let, humor me and let's go through the Gauss Jordan elimination process on this matrix. So let's change it to a matrix. That matrix will have two rows because I have two equations. I'm going to copy my numbers 3, 5, bar, 1, 1, 2, bar, 1. Okay. So let's go through the process. So in Gauss Jordan elimination, Right, step zero. Is there a row of all zeros? No, there's not. I don't need to move anything to the bottom. Step two says, or step one says, find the first non zero number in the top row. This thing is the pivot. And I know I don't want to, I don't want to, you, you probably going to dislike me for a moment. Notice how to make this number into a 1, which is the next step, right? To make this number into a 1, I would have to multiply times 1 over 3. And fractions, I, I'm going to try to avoid fractions as long as I can. So I'm actually going to get to do a small shortcut here. Notice how I already have a 1 down here. It's not in the right position for it to be the pivot. But what if I use row exchange to bring that row back up to the correct position? So this is technically a shortcut. And you have to be a little careful because as long as you're bringing rows up and never taking them down, I know it, I know it seems weird to say that because by bringing one row up, you are necessarily taking all the other rows down. But what I think of is I can take this row number two and bring it up right to the correct position. It will keep all of the other numbers in the right place. And I know right now that doesn't mean a whole lot because none of the numbers are in the right place. You'll see what I mean in the next in the next step. So let me bring this matrix down and exchange the position of the rows. Hey, that's nice. Do you see now when I look at my pivot, my pivot is now already a one. So in step two, I don't have to worry about making it a one. This pivot is already a one. The pivot is already one. I don't have to do anything. I'm happy to use that shortcut. It saved me a whole step and a bunch of fractions. But now we have to we have to kind of pay for that. After step two, right? Remember step three says use linear combinations with the one to make all the other numbers in that column zero. That is this. Three. I need this 3 to become a 0. How do you make a 3 into a 0? I need a negative 3. Where do I get a negative 3 from? With the 1. Negative 3 times row 1. You see how I can, I can get the negative version of any number I want to? Because you multiply it times the 1. That's why this is so genius. Is because by making the 1 first, I can change that one into anything I need it to using a linear combination. So now times negative three makes it a negative three plus row two replaces row two. So there's my linear combination operation. I know it looks like a mouthful, but let's see it in action. So negative three times row one plus row two, add them together, that becomes my new row one. All right, negative three times row one, negative three, negative six, negative three, 
Notice how in my scratch work, I never put the bars, right? I never make it look like a matrix because I don't want to confuse myself when I go back to look at this. In my second row, I didn't do anything to it. I didn't multiply the second row times anything. It's technically times one, but... But when I add them together, I get that zero that I really wanted. And I'm going to replace that back into row number two. So zero, negative one, negative two. And the rows, the row one numbers did not change. Hey, that's nice. You see how I have an entire column of ones and zeros now? That's what one trip through the Gauss-Jordan process is going to do for us. Right? The entire column is now fixed. It looks like part of my identity pattern. Let's bring that back up to the next step. Start working on the next row. Because remember, Gauss-Jordan process continues until we run out of rows. So at this point, the first row is done. Let's look at the second row. In the second row, step zero says, are there rows of all zeros? No. Step one says, find the first or the leftmost non-zero number. That's the pivot. Not that one, that's a zero. So that must be this number. You see how in, I, in an ideal world, this will always be on the diagonal. In an ideal world. So there's my pivot for row number two. It's not a one already, so I'm going to have to actually make it a one using multiplication now. What number do I have to multiply times negative one to make it positive one? Times negative one. I always draw my arrows too short, but I drew that one too long. Row one numbers did not change. Row two numbers do change. Aha! Awesome. I'm almost done. Okay, put a box back around my pivot just so I remember where it is. Okay, so now that I have my pivot and now that the pivot is equal to 1, I'm going to use the linear combinations to make all the other numbers in the same column into zeros. So let's see, that means I'm working on this number here. How do you make a 2 into a 0? You use a negative 2. But where do I get that negative 2 from? Well, I multiply that negative 2 times the pivot. You see how times row 2 this time, because that's where the pivot is. The pivot is the special 1. That's the blank canvas. You can always make that into the negative number I'm looking for. Negative 2, row 2 plus row 1, replaces row 1. Ooh. Got to get out my scratch work here. Negative 2, row 2, plus row 1, equals new row 2. Negative 2 times row 2, 0, negative 2, negative 4, plus row 1, equals new row 1. one zero negative 3. Row 2 did not change. I'm just copying it down. At this point, row 2 is done. 
because the entire column uh, that the pivot was in was all ones and zeros. And at this point, the entire matrix is done. Because do you see how I have the identity pattern now? I'm done. And I can read my solution directly out of the matrix. X equals negative 3. Y equals positive 2. That's my solution. If I need to put that in an ordered pair, I can do that. Right? Either way is fine, depending on how it requires you to enter your answer on my open math. You can always check your answer by going and plugging them back in way up here at the top. Plug in those numbers. Make sure that negative, or excuse me, make sure that 3x plus 5y is actually equal to 1. And make sure that x plus 2y is actually equal to 1. You know, it's going to feel really hard to do this process for a while. I know that. Um, I'm going to post a link on my open math probably tomorrow. Right, for a website that will help you do these operations. The ones that you do on your test, I'm going to be looking for all of this work. I want to see the, the pivot pointed out. I want to see the scratch work that I've done in blue here. I want to see all the row operations that I've done in red. I need to see all of that. Because if I give you basically a calculator to help you do the arithmetic, then if you don't show me those things, I'm going to have to assume that you use the calculator and you don't actually know what you're doing. And that's it. that would be really sad because, again, Gauss-Jordan is not the whole point of what we're doing. We're going to be using these ideas to do something better in the future. And so if you don't understand the Gauss-Jordan ideas, then it's going to be really hard to do those ideas in the future. And, and the ideas in the future the calculators that exist are much less reliable, what I'll say. And that's the problem with math, right? You can write a calculator to do a specific math that you want, but then when you want to use that math, then you're, you've kind of you've set yourself up for failure if, if you didn't understand the math which came before it. So it's always really tough when it comes to calculators. But this process is a great process. I, I know it, it seemed, I'm going to scroll back up to the list of steps, I know it seemed almost like a big dense block, like a fire, like, like it had too much metamucil. It's just a dense, un unbreakable block of, of ideas and mathematics. But once you get into it, once you, once you start seeing all the little pieces move around, right, you'll see, well, actually, that makes a whole lot of sense. Right? And before long, right, small problems like the one we just did, you'll be able to knock those things out. And, maybe four or five minutes, even showing all the steps, right? You could probably do them much faster if you didn't have to show all your steps, but I'll make sure you have enough time on your test to do all the problems we need to. So it's a fascinating method, right? I wish I would have come up with it. I wish it was the Trevino elimination method, but it's not, right? But it's, it's a great method that we'll, we'll continue to use throughout at least Test two and test three. Test four is different. But I'll stop it here because, again, I didn't want it to be too long. I know this is going to be a long video anyway, but um, have a good weekend. Right? I'm available by email, uh, my open math for practice, and I'll see you on the boards where I'll post the calculator link maybe tomorrow. Have a good one.